Welcome to a beautiful day in Ubud. I've been up for a while now. You can see I haven't made my bed. I want to show you the area where I live. I want to show you where I'm staying. So let's go out to the balcony first. So this is the balcony for my room and it overlooks this beautiful garden. So right there, that's the garden. And then there's also the swimming pool, which is there. And when I'm lucky, when it's not so cloudy, I get to see the sunrise from that side. Oh, and can you see that building right there in the background? That's part of the place where I want to discover. I hear it's a Russian place and I really like Russians. You know, I was in Russia just before COVID. It's the last place that I got to travel. So I want to go and check out and find out what's going on yeah, there. Yeah, this is my room. So this is where I stay. I'm not going to apologize for not making my bed. It's early and I'm going to do it when I come back or get somebody else to do it. That's why I'm staying in a hotel, a little boutique hotel. Um, this is one of the features that I love. The fact that you can see from the bathroom into the bedroom and vice versa. It's really cool. Let me show you um, this place. So we're going to go out through there. There's a walk-in closet. There's the toilet, which is the first door there. And then this bathtub that I absolutely love. And the sink, I like that feature. Hi! <laughs> and um, the shower there. So yeah, this is pretty much it. All right, so one interesting thing about Bali is they are Hindu by religion, so it's a form of Hinduism. Uh, it's different from the Indian Hinduism, but it's related in some ways. And one of the things that you'll notice is there's always like one of those shrines, you can see it behind me, that one right there, that one. So it's like a shrine or a temple that they have in all houses. And that's where they go and they do the offering. They put flowers, incense, gifts, sometimes money, sometimes food, sometimes sweets. I've seen cigarettes. <laughs> I don't get it, but hey, it is what it is. <laughs> so yeah, they are very spiritual. And as a result, they also, because they believe in karma, they also tend to do good. They tend to be good people. And they believe that um, if you're not aware about karma, it's like what goes around comes around. So they tend to not want to do things that will come back and bite them in the behind. We're going out into the garden, the garden area, and this is it. So this is what you are seeing from the room, uh, that walkway which goes out to the parking and the road, and then this that goes to the pool area. So that's my room right there. You can see I have like really great view. And this is the pool. So they're quite diligent because from early in the morning they put out towels for those who want to swim. I love to swim. So I usually get a place that has a pool because I want to have that option even if I don't exercise it every day. <laughs> and yeah, look at the flowers, just little details that they do to welcome you and make you feel at home. This is a lot of Bali. You'll notice like flowers put around. It's really nice, like it's, it's super beautiful. I love it. I feel so welcome uh, here. Speaking of welcoming, Bali people really understand hospitality. They are, they take care of the details and they cater to tourists. I believe this island, um, maybe 80% if not more, is of their revenue is tourism, from tourism. So they really do care for their tourists and they know how to take care of them. Yeah, so this is the area that comes to, if you have a scooter, you can park it here. So scooters are the main mode of transport here. And you'll see on the road, like I was trying to go out early before the scooters, before there are too many scooters, because they can get a lot. We'll find out if there are a lot. But yeah, it's the main mode of transport. And let me tell you, they drive crazily. Um, I've been on the back of scooters and just <laughs> been like, Oops. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they drive crazily. So being on the back of a scooter, sometimes I'm busy like moving my knees because I think I'm going to get into the way or get hit by a pole or passing between cars, like overtaking on the left-hand side, which is 
because they drive on the left, when you're overtaking on the left hand side, it's just really crazy. So that's fun fact. <laughs> All right, so this is going up to the reception. Look at the flowers. Isn't that cool? It's just beautiful. They make you feel so welcome. Uh, and they have really cute, cool furniture. Oh my gosh, it's, it's incredible. Um, look at this, they put for you flowers. They usually have a shrine, especially like at receptions, cashiers and stuff like that. And they do offerings there as well. So you'll find they'll put incense. Uh, oh yeah, there, there is incense. Um, and they'll put flowers and offerings there as well. So this is the hotel, that's the name of the hotel interesting stuff on the walls and hi morning i'm just recording yeah i'll come for breakfast later all right thank you oh look at this furniture i absolutely love it yeah <laughs> yeah so this is the the breakfast area so i don't want to intrude on a family that's having breakfast there but the higher road um, bikes, it's getting a bit noisy, so let's go outside. Hi, Sandy. Hello, how are you? Say hello. Um, hello. <laughs> All right, I'll see you later for breakfast. Okay. Hi, morning. Okay, so let's go down to and discover the area around where I'm staying. So this is a kind of shortcut where instead of going through the main entrance of the hotel which is there i'm coming down the side steps that go straight to the restaurant and to the road um, so this is how it looks like around where i'm staying and you can see it's been raining there's a lot of water but they've got very good drainage. They drain a lot of it into the rice fields from what I've found. Oh yeah, there is the drainage. Yeah, so Bali has been an interesting experience for me. Uh, I've absolutely loved it. I'm seeing how different it is between Changu, where I spent about a month, and Ubud. Like Changu is on the coastline, it's on the beach. And it's very um, like fitness people, digital nomads and stuff like that. And Ubud is more in the mountains and it's peace and serene. A lot of meditation and stuff goes on here. Uh, but it, they all have these really cute restaurants and shops. Look at that place. Yeah, that's so cool. So we're going to walk around and, and discover. Look at that. It's been raining quite a bit um yeah the noise can be a lot there are dogs everywhere oh yeah the dogs are not usually on leashes so you can see how that dog was just sitting out there it will come out maybe go hang out with its friends and then get back uh later so that's that's really interesting how dogs are not on leashes and how they just go back home in the evening. Hello! It's been almost two months since I came to Bali. I almost can't believe it because time has flown by so, so fast. And right now I'm actually at an immigration services office trying to extend my visa. I'll tell you the, the process of that as well. Let me just show you, this is where it is. And I decided to use their boardroom to make this video because earlier I was filming and it started raining. So I just said, okay, let me come and do this first and then I can film this video before I go for my next thing later on in the day. So what I did is I put together a number of observations, things that I've noticed about Bali that I wanted to share with you. But then the list is not comprehensive because there's still so much stuff you can imagine in two months. So even in subsequent videos, I'll be sharing more with you. But to start with, let me give you an idea about Indonesia. Let's start with Indonesia. So Bali is in Indonesia and Indonesia is an archipelago of islands so there are various various islands that make it up and it's just above Australia 
and below uh, Malaysia. And there's Singapore there as well. So that's where Indonesia is. And in terms of size, Indonesia is 1.9 million square kilometers. And if, you know, I'm Kenyan, and when I was looking at Indonesia, I was also comparing Indonesia and Kenya. So Kenya, the size of Kenya is 582,646 square kilometers. So Indonesia is three times bigger than Kenya. Right? And then in terms of population, the population of Indonesia as of 2022 was, was um, 275.5 million people. That's a lot of people, because America, I think it's, America is about, what, 300 million people? So Indonesia has quite a huge population, and America is way bigger. <laughs> And in terms of um, population in Kenya, as of 2022, it was 54 million people, which means that Indonesia is five times more populated than Kenya and only three times or 3.2 times bigger. So Indonesia is very dense. And I'm giving you those stats so that you can also have some perspective in terms of how dense and how big Indonesia is, because it's really, really big. And what that also means is that places are different from one place to another. If you go to Jakarta, it's going to be a very different experience from Bali, from Flores, from Surabaya, from like the different islands. So you also have to understand that you know they're different, that will play a huge part, and that also plays a part in how different the people are. In Bali, the religion is Hinduism, some form of Hinduism, and that makes the people very different from Jakarta where the, the dominant religion is Islam. And actually most of Indonesia is Islam. It's just Bali is a very unique place that is mostly um, Hindu. And there are places like Kina Flores that are mostly Catholic. So every place differs greatly. Like the people in these different places, they differ a lot. Oh yeah, and then in terms of revenue, so Bali contributes significantly to Indonesia's tourism revenue. And it does, from the last figures that I found online, it does 40% of Indonesia's tourism revenue. And 80% of revenue from Bali is from tourism. So tourism is a huge contributor to the economy in Bali. And you can see it from the way everything is designed, the little cafes, the, the hospitality. Like these guys have hospitality at a completely different level. Like they are they're really, they really understand what it's like to make things really comfortable for you. And you saw this like uh, in the place where I'm staying. The thing that lets them down is English, because English is not widely spoken in Bali, and you kind of struggle to find people who speak proper English. So a lot of the times I end up speaking broken English, I end up speaking like slowly, but at least you will be comfortable if you come to Bali. They make it very comfortable. Restaurants, like the, the place, the boutiques, the nightlife and all that. I'll talk about each of these as I go along in this video. So in terms of getting here, visa, if uh, I can't speak for visas for, for every country, but I can speak about my experience for Kenya. And for the Kenyan visa, they, we now are eligible to apply for a visa online, which is what I would recommend that you do, that you apply for your visa online. We also have a, a consulate in Kenya. Um, I think if I remember correctly, the cost was higher and they needed more documentation and it takes longer. But when you apply online, the documentation you'll require, of course, is your passport. You'll require a picture. So you'll need to upload a picture onto the platform. You'll need a place where you're staying. Uh, I 
think you need your flight. I'm not sure. No, no, no. You didn't need your flight, but you need a bank statement. So you need to show that you can support yourself for up to, for at least a minimum of $2,000. So you need a bank statement that reflects $2,000 and above. Um, that's if you're the one who's sponsoring yourself. I think if you're being sponsored, that's a different thing. I don't really have experience in that, but because I was sponsoring myself, that's what I had to show. And you do this online, it's pretty easy. I'll put a link below this video if you want to know the official website to do the application. I got this from the consulate at, um, in Kenya and it's worked for me. The process is pretty seamless once you have all the documentation, once you have the picture in the right format that they ask you to do it in, um, it's pretty straightforward and then there's a fee to be paid and you can pay it online as well using a card so it makes it very easy. Uh, in terms of getting flights, you know, online booking, the world has become much smaller because you can do this a few hours before you jump onto a flight, so it's really convenient. And then accommodation as well, I get everything online. I always book all my trips, so I book everything from my flights, I book my accommodation, I don't use an agent. The only time I use agents is when I'm doing tours, and usually I'll be in the country and then organize a tour and maybe join a group tour with an agent within that country who specializes in such tours. The only place I ended up doing it way in advance and out of country was for Peru, because I wanted to climb Machu Picchu, and it was such a great experience. And they have a limitation on how many people they allow every year, so you have to book your, get your ticket and get your agency and all that set up before, before like early enough. I, I think I did it maybe six months in advance, and that's the only trip that I've done that I've really had to organize way earlier. Um, usually I organize my trips like within two weeks, three weeks. Uh, and I do this intentionally because I also don't want to start planning trips way in advance and then start having expectations and start imagining how things should be and then spend the next like three months thinking about my holiday before I get there. I do it last minute. Sometimes I even do it like a few days before I travel. And honestly, the internet has made it so easy. There's no excuse. There's no reason why you can't do it like really fast. There's a time I booked a flight in the morning and that evening I was on a flight to the States. <laughs> so I had my visa. Of course, the visa you have to sort out way before. But I had that part taken care of. But I booked my flight and that evening I was out. It's honestly not that complicated. It's made to look complicated. It's, it's really not. I've been doing this for years. Uh, and then, oh yeah, so in terms of visa extension, <laughs> the visa extension is going to cost me more than the visa. Because one, I'm using an agent, and maybe I should have realized that when they put for you sparkling water and their offices are this pretty, <laughs> that it's going to cost me and I'm gonna pay for it but um, it is what it is I decided to use an agent instead of doing it directly because I went online to try and do my extension and I don't know the website doesn't seem to enable me it just I just kept going round in circles I go I do I click on the button that says extend my visa but it takes me to a page that's blank that's not showing me any visa application and there is no button to add then I go to another place where it says extend. Then when I click, it just gives me the visa that I have. And then um, the next option has like a drop down. But then when you click it, nothing happens. So I spent like time trying to figure that part out. And at some point I just give up because I also don't have that much time. And I just said, you know what, I'll pay the extra fee, come to an agent who will sort out everything for me because I may have also had to go to Denbazar which is closer to Changu to get my visa validated or something uh, and that's also time because sometimes you have to like I was checking out videos of people who have to go leave their passport come back get their fingerprints done for me I don't need to get my fingerprints done once you get that visa that uh, visa online the 60 day one because there's a visa upon arrival that you can also apply <coughs> online. 
but once you get like the one I applied for, which gives you 60 days, you don't need your fingerprints done. And the process at the airport is so easy. You don't talk to anyone. You go to a place, like it's, it's like those doors that open up, they're glass doors. You go, you stand there, you scan, you scan your passport at the door, the doors open. Then, uh, of course, at that point, the doors are opening because they verified your visa. And then when you go in, uh, they take your picture, they tell you, okay, stand here, take your picture, cool. And then the doors open on the other side and it's like, that's it. Welcome to Bali. I was like, oh, that was easy. And then right after they send you an email with now your, your stay, your permit stay. I was like, this is what uh, immigrations should be like instead of having to talk to somebody where are you from what do you do where are you staying show me your ticket for return like all these questions how much money do you have this was just the most seamless process I have ever gone through like congratulations honestly to the Indonesian government for introducing that and it's also very COVID safe so in case we ever have another pandemic this is like the fastest way to get through so yeah, enough, I guess, about getting to in, into Indonesia and getting to Bali. Let's talk about the observations. So first observation is how this is like a smoker's paradise. So many people smoke. So many people smoke either like real cigarettes or electronic cigarettes. And they have shops for vaping, vaping stores and whatever everywhere. I was in shock because I'm coming from Kenya where not too many people smoke in Kenya. Like these days, you smokers are kind of just out there. First of all, they're not allowed to smoke indoors anywhere. They have to go find their own spot. But in Indonesia, every restaurant allows you to smoke indoors. Like it doesn't matter. There are some restaurants, I'm sure, that don't allow that. Oh yeah, there's a Serenity. I went to this place, which is like very... Uh, eco-friendly, vegan, very nice, really nice place and it's also where I go for my group sitting meditation in Changu and the owner is fantastic, I absolutely love her, she's a Vipassana teacher so she, like her place, no smoking, no alcohol um, and that's the first place I have found but otherwise everybody like smokes, guys are always vaping, there are ashtrays like everywhere, I'm sure even here if I asked to smoke they would be an like they would bring me an ashtray. There are no smoke detectors. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> like people smoke here everywhere. So yeah, that's something that you know. If you smoke, you love it because you can smoke everywhere. If you don't, it, it's not like you have to dodge people smoke all the time. I don't know because most places are airy, so you'll not even really feel it. You'll rarely feel it unless you the person is really near you. Or you're in a nightclub and you smell your hair the next day. For those of you who have hair, that was before I cut my hair. I used to wake up in the morning, I'm like, oh my God, this reminds me of the days I used to go clubbing and come back home smelling of smoke. But in Bali, yeah, I mean, like now it doesn't really matter. <laughs> cool. And the second thing is uh, tattoos. People love tattoos. Kwanzaa in Changu. There are so many tattoo parlors like everywhere and it seems everyone has a tattoo. In Obud it seems to be different. Like people here are more spiritual and more uh, conservative in, you know, from what I have seen and I haven't been here long enough. But, um, and I would say actually a little hippie too. <laughs> but when it comes to tattoos in Changu, oh my goodness, like the number of people. I was looking at a picture the other day of this, this, um, this beach club and I'd been invited. So they shared, I was in the group, though I didn't go because I was in, I was, I'm in Ubud. And the, the pictures they had shared, one of the ladies has a tattoo, her entire leg, one of her legs all the way until her waist is like colorful tattoos and then she's got more things on her hands and I was like my goodness and it's not surprising to see like whether it's locals or uh, foreigners with lots of tattoos the whole back covered with tattoos female male like everyone like people it's almost like tattoos are are 
I, I, I don't get it because I don't have a tattoo. I mean, if you have a tattoo, you know, good for you. I, I, you know, I may admire your tattoo depending on how it's been done, but then I have no plans to get a tattoo. I personally do not subscribe to that. Uh, and maybe that's why I notice it a lot. Maybe that's why like, I notice I'm always like, wow, people have tattoos like everywhere. <laughs> and then tattoo parlors, yeah. Let me not belabor that point. The roads, the roads. So the first time I remember when I was coming from the airport, we, were, we went down this road to get me to my guest house where I was staying. And I was like, is this a one-way street? That's what I assumed. Later on, I found out that it's a two-way street. All these streets are really narrow. They look like a one-way road, and some of them have lines in the middle. But because the primary mode of transport in Bali is border borders, motorbikes, ndudi, the roads are really narrow. So two cars can't pass each other. Apart from like highways near Den Bazaar and stuff like that, like you know, bigger areas, within Changu and even here in Ubud, like two cars, there are few roads where two cars can pass each other at speed. They all have to like slow down and pass each other uh, and more often than not, like climb the curb a little, maybe stop, maybe slow down. So it means that if you're using a car, it will take you way longer to get to where you need to go which is why motorbikes are such a plan, because you jump onto a motorbike and the guy's like zoom, 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 zoom. And let me tell you, they drive badly. Well, let me not say badly, since we don't exactly drive really well in Kenya. <laughs> Nairobi, driving in Nairobi is chaotic. So this is very familiar for me. <laughs> but still, it's mostly cars driving chaotically. And yes, the border borders and the motorbikes, you know, they weave around and they break rules and stuff like that. But here it's like at another level. Like, if you're driving in a car, honestly, like, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know how you do it. But here, you, the motorbikes overtake on the left. And because they drive on the left, when you're overtaking another car on the left, like in Kenya would never do that because that person could be turning, could open a door, like a passenger could open a door. But here it's like you, you overtake on the left, you overtake on the right, you like are constantly, they hoot a lot, but not aggressive hooting, more like, hey, hey, wake up, move, the lights have changed, or hey, what's up? They say hello through hooting, or hey, hey, I hope you saw me. So it's very, beep, beep, just like, boop. You know, it's not eh, like annoying kind of hooting, but they hoot a lot. So they are constantly like hooting and weaving through traffic and moving just a little bit. And then another car passes and then all the motorbikes move, zing. And then because the roads are slender, so it, it, it's, it's chaotic. And then the, the cars that in, in some places, which are like major roads, the cars are passing each other, they have to bring in the side mirror to pass each other. And it's like a proper major road. I haven't understood how the infrastructure is done here, but it's just shocking. Where, uh, yeah, it's, it will surprise you if you're like me and you're used to wider proper roads for cars to zoom past each other and even overtake and even make a third lane out of a two lane road, uh, you'll be surprised in this one. Uh, and there are no sidewalks. So you, most of places, and I've seen this as well with Ubud, the Ubud seems to have a little, a few more sidewalks, but in Changu, there were very few sidewalks. When I tried to walk on the roads, I'm constantly, having to stop and wait for traffic, constantly having to cross over puddles and manholes, and it was crazy. The manholes are big, like a meter, a meter square, so you can't be on your phone, you can't be filming, <laughs> you fall into a manhole, and they are big and deep. <laughs> the lack of sidewalks was just really, it just meant that you can't really walk around freely between shops and like sightseeing, which is something I like doing, just looking at the different shops, entering random shops, entering random restaurants. You have to do it with a plan. Now let's talk about the people. 
So what my observation has been with uh, people in Bali, at least in Changu and Ubud where I've been, is the Balinese people, because of their Hindu religion and the fact that they believe in karma, they generally are good people. And this is a really safe place to travel because people here just don't do funny things, at least not what I've seen. I've seen shops that barely look like they don't take away the furniture when they close in the evening. They just put the seats on top of the table and then put like some makeshift um, good thing that you could just like walk past, lift and walk past, but that's how they close their shop in the evening. Uh, some have the grills, yes, and everything, but it generally looks safe. People leave their motorbikes out, um, people put their helmets on their motorbikes and have been doing this for years. Like I have some friends who told me that and they're just like, no one really bothers. Like it's, it's generally a safe place and people are genuinely good. The thing is, is that they won't really let you in. Like you'll notice that there's going to be a gap between you, the tourist, and the Balinese person. They'll ask you questions, they'll engage with you, but they won't really, like, and maybe language barrier is one of those things, but you'll notice like they, they won't really be that closeness and like that much, um, what do you call it? Like, you know how you, you bond with people and you feel like you've been adopted? Here it feels very, you're the tourist, we're the people, we're nice, but you know, you, you're the tourist, you stay that way. Um, so that's what my observation has been. They'll be very warm, very like smiling all the time, welcoming and all that, but you will notice that there will be that gap. Um, so that's what I've noticed. And the culture here is really strong. Let me give you a story. The other day I went on tour and I was with this uh, guy, the driver who was on the tour, he's from Bali. So I was asking him questions like, you know, about his wife, he's been married for years and he's got kids, maybe about, is it like 15 years? I asked him, so do you have a girlfriend? And he's like, girlfriend? No. How? I'm married. And I was like, oh, okay, um, so you you wouldn't have a girlfriend like on the side or anything he's like no like it was unheard of for him and i told him like in my country a lot of married men have girlfriends and he's like how what about the community when people see you what what happens i'm like they've even changed that introduced a law where it's legal to marry more than one wife he's like he was shocked that you could literally marry more than one person. For him, he was just like really shocked at the possibility of having a girlfriend or marrying more than one person. It's like unheard of. He said, no, when you marry in, in Hindu, in their culture and their religion, when you marry, you marry for life. And if you have to separate, it has to be really extreme and it's very complicated. So we started talking about Kenyan culture and how Kenyan men, ten, Kenyan married men, not all of them, I know some of you are going to be in the comments there bitching about this, but hey, it is the way it is. A lot of married Kenyan men have girlfriends on the side, more than one girlfriend sometimes. So it is what it is, but here it's like, unheard of according to the to this guy and he was saying that the community would even be the ones to tell on you if they saw you with another girl like everybody kind of polices each other and i guess that's why it's also really safe because everybody kind of polices each other and he was just like i mean he was just saying they for him it was unheard of and the possibility was not even there so hey for those Kenyan girls who are thinking of coming to Bali to get married to a man who will be loyal. <laughs> well, and hey, here is to the Kenyan men who do not cheat on their girlfriends or their wives. You know, thumbs up to them. It's unfortunately become the stories that we get to hear. So maybe some of you who are really genuinely honest and have 
great relationships and work on your relationships because no relationship is perfect off the go. You have to work on it to make it that way. For those of you who are that way, we don't get to hear too many about, uh, we don't get to hear too much about your stories. We don't get to hear a lot about you. So it biases a lot of people when they're thinking the only stories you get to hear are the negative stories. So if you're out there, if you're watching this, like kudos to you, I'm really, really happy for you. Because I'm one of those romantics who believes in love and I'm, I'm happy like, if, if that's you too. Um, so yeah, ah, the next thing, let's talk about Mama Bali. Wow, I don't know whether to talk about this one last, but Mama Bali is, we call her Mama Bali, at least this was the term somebody used on me and I kind of have been using it. And it's really whether Bali accepts you or doesn't or spits you out. So we say Mama Bali either accepts you or she spits you out. She listens, so be careful what you wish for because a lot of things that you wish for will come true. So you have to be really careful. And I have experienced this myself. First of all, even coming to Bali was like a calling. I didn't have Bali on my list of places to go, but then when it showed up, it was like a force that was just pushing me in this direction and guiding me. Actually, guiding is more the word than pushing. It wasn't by force, but I could feel like doors were just being opened and I was being made to like take this trip and take it at this time. And then when I got here, there have been so many things that have just happened that have just demonstrated how, how Bali just wanted me here like one of the things i did is the visa takes five working days when you apply i applied exactly i was told when i called the consulate i was told yeah yeah it's if you apply online you could get it immediately but then i applied five days before and i assumed it's going to come immediately and then i checked the next day and nothing and the day after that and nothing at this point i was in kuala lumpur and i didn't have a visa to go into Bali and I'd already bought my ticket and booked accommodation on that side and scheduled myself for Vipassana. But my visa came on the evening before and it came at 6.30 6 or 6.40 p.m., which is way past the time immigration works. And I remember not being worried or not feeling any tension. And all I said is, hey, if Bali wants me to come, Bali will make it happen. And that was it. And I went around my day, was checking out of my hotel room. And I remember opening my laptop and I was just like, wow, my visa came in yesterday evening. So cool. That's it. And since I've been here, Bali has really just Mama Bali has really delivered like she has made my path much easier than I would have expected little things like me sitting down and thinking of uh, like the place I was staying I was staying at this guest house and they didn't have a table that I could work on and I don't really like sitting on my bed to work so I remember having a thought of oh it would be nice to have like a table and then the next day, they deliver tables to, to every room. Like, it was so funny. And I got the first one because on that day when they were assembling them, I happened to pass by and I saw the tables. I was like, wait, what's this? And they're like, oh, every room is getting a table. I'm like, oh my goodness. And they looked at my enthusiasm and they're like, would you like this first one? We've just assembled this one. I was like, yeah within two minutes it was set up in my room like that's how quickly things happen things around my business i've had this idea i also came here as you know trying to figure things out on uh, in regards to my business and i'll separate that because it's a long story but the way in which it has happened i could not have designed it that way i could not have forced it to be the way it is it just happened better than I had the capability of making happen. So it's nice, like, and, and to fondly call this, you know, say Mama Bali, like, it's, it's nice and it's, it's, 
it's what uh, in Bali a lot of the tourists at least that I've engaged with we we call her um, and we've decided she's female <laughs> and usually it's the females I'm talking to who are calling her mama Bali so hey go figure <laughs> but yeah if if you're good if you do good like whether anyone's watching or not honestly I believe that that comes back to you and that's when you end up with serendipitous moments that are aligned and there to support you, to help you to your goal. And that includes money, by the way, as well. Huh? I've, had, I've had thoughts where I'm like, oh, I need extra money for this. And let me tell you, it shows up in very interesting ways. Either it shows up as money or it shows up as an opportunity where I don't have to spend the money or any money to do the thing I wanted to do. <laughs> like, seriously, that's what I'm telling you. It's, it's kind of freaky, but I love it. I love it. That's why I'm staying here longer and extending my visa. <laughs> I will be back eventually. <laughs> Speaking of being accepted, let me tell you a little about the community that I've, I've been in while I'm here. I stayed in this guest house and the lady who was in the room next was really cool, Chinese lady, we got to talking, she's a surfer, we just had a good time hanging out and she introduces me to this community which I then end up in and that community embraces me and I get invited for so many things and I've been so, like, I have not lacked things to do, things from yoga classes, to girls' night out where there's free drinks for women. Crazy, let me tell you, this place is just crazy. The first time that happened, where it was like free drinks and free food for us girls. I thought it was a joke. I went because I was skeptical and I was like, let me just go and see how this works. And then I show up and it's actually true. Like it was free food. I had sushi, I had salmon, and they even have dessert and free drinks for women because you're a woman. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm still in the group and I keep seeing that like last week people went for one and there was another one a few days ago. Most of them happen in Changu. I haven't found any in Ubud. So I'm like watching with FOMO and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm missing out on the free flow for girls. They have this app called Grab. And Grab makes it so easy for you. Grab and Gojak, there are two of them. I hear there's a third one, but I don't know that one. But Grab and Gojak make it so easy for you to get a bike, get a car, order food, have your groceries delivered. It's incredible. So the convenience here is like at another level. I absolutely love it. I wish other countries would borrow from this. Uber, if you're listening, there's no reason why Uber for the cars and the motorbikes is different from Uber Eats. I've always wondered why you have two apps, why I have to download two separate apps. These guys make it really simple with one app that has everything and then it's got deals they give you these discounts that are limited for a period they've got like dining deals so if you want to go like i used this at um, a pork place that i love in changu but if you want to get a dining deal you get like 20 percent discount at the place and then as you see the discount and everything they ask you do you want to order a car or um, a bike to go to the place and once you click you know order the next thing your bike is five minutes away or two minutes away or your driver is nearby go to the meeting point it's really convenient so my goodness if somebody from uber or from which other one go uh, um, bolt or a little cab is listening let me tell you borrow from these guys because they are at another level especially grab i use grab a lot i don't use gojack that much uh, i use grab and i even have like an unlimited package where i pay a certain amount every month and i get like discounted fares for things and deals so i'm like such a happy customer and then i've got my card there so i never have to start looking for change or give directions like i just order the guy comes he gives me a helmet i put it on i get to the destination i get out give him his helmet and i'm done like you can imagine 
with the little English that is spoken in Bali, how things would be difficult if I had to start explaining to the the bike guy where I'm going or uh, yeah, it's it's hard enough as it is. Yeah, food. I know I keep being asked about food, you know, like my friends, my friends keep asking me about the food here and the food here is really good. I think the food in Thailand is way better. <laughs> but the food here is good. It's just, I find it's nice and spicy. I love sambal. I, I love the convenience of being able to order food and it comes to you in proper packaging and it's still hot and everything and really quickly. Um, I enjoy their dishes, some of their dishes, some of the restaurants. Uh, nasi goreng, which is like one of their main dishes that's like a rice, fried rice with egg and chicken, is okay, but then I, I, yeah, I, I rarely end up, I've eaten it like once or twice, and then the rest of the time I'm always looking for dills and other things like prunes and pork and like chicken, grilled chicken and crispy chicken and all that, but I do love the, the, fact that the, the variety of restaurants and how the restaurants are set up and how beautiful they are and how themed they are like the restaurants are most of like the proper restaurants have a theme like whether it's fish seafood or like moana which is like hawaiian so it's more fish and seafoody or uh, mexicana which is mexican or you go to um, gosh, there's so many. I, I, I can't believe I'm forgetting some of them. Or the Happy Pork place, like it's pork, or it's a place that does mostly chicken. Or, uh, but they, the way they are themed, or uh, Vietnamese, or um, like just different. And con even if it's continental, it's the restaurant has a theme. Like it's rustic, or it's industrial, or it's classy or it's, you know, uh, hippie, like Bohemian. Bohemia is a place I went the other day in Ubud, so cool. It's got incredible decor, very Bohemian, and that's the theme, very hippie-like too. And that's, that's, that's how places are here. Like they have themes. I, I really love that. And I remember talking about it in, um, when I was talking about customer experience, talking about creating themes like restaurants or businesses with themes. So where were we? Um, we've talked about community and I've mentioned that I, I feel accepted in the community here and it's been really welcoming and I've had great coincidences that are leading to things that are very exciting coming up. One of the goals that I had when I came to Bali was to do something, to figure out um, something around my business. There was a question that I had and I was also coming here to make connections around that. And I'll tell you more about it, but I actually met the people who um, I'm going to be working with and it's a very exciting project coming up. So more, more on that later. Uh, so now let me go to the language. So whenever I travel to different places, most of the times I don't even speak the local language. Um, but I tend to try and learn a few things before I leave. So I go on to whether it's like a YouTube video that has phrases and a few things that I can learn. But when it comes to Bahasa Indonesia, I didn't really... I mean, again, I planned the trip really with very little time, but I didn't really um, try and learn that much. So I don't know much, but then it's not been a problem with me being able to get whatever it is that I need. Like if I go to a shop or whatever and I need to buy something or ask for something, I usually download Google Translate in advance. So I have that saved to work with or without internet so I can always ask around in case I need to but most of the times I haven't needed to just like sign language and you kind of get your way around plus the language is like when you read the word most of the words that I've found um, and it's like most of the words are a misspelling or a, a way of saying an English word but then spelling it like a four-year-old kid 
you know and a lot of words are like that like there are very many words that I've found that you can kind of figure out what they're trying to say by thinking of what it sounds like <laughs> so that's really interesting um, in terms of beaches I haven't really been to the Bali beaches that we hear about the famous Bali beaches so primarily the beaches I've been to in Changu which is black sand beaches not that great um, in terms of oh, uh, there are some ladies who are sunbathing and um, I didn't know it's actually a thing like people sit out in the sun for a whole day they've been out from morning till now I've seen that they're getting ready to leave um, but yeah in terms of beaches Changu has black sand beaches they're mostly for surfers so it's if you're a surfer like it's some really great beaches but if you're going there looking for white sand blue water to swim and just like lounge and take nice Instagram pictures Mm, not so much. I hear Uluwatu has great beaches. It's cliffy so you have to go down lots of stairs to get to the beach but I hear it's really nice. Um, so in terms of beaches, mm, uh, not yet. I'll, I'll share once I do. There are places that I'm going to go to look for really nice beaches um, and once I get there, yeah, I'll be sure to share with you. <laughs> Um, but what they have, which is really cool, are beach clubs. So they have these beach clubs which are not near the beach most of the time. Some of them are. And these beach clubs are set up to have like a beach vibe. They've got music playing. Like it's really nice. The pools are, they have like multiple pools, sometimes cascading pools. And you don't, I mean, you don't really miss the fact that you're, you don't have a really nice beach to swim in because the pools are like big and warm and some of them have infinity pools that overlook the ocean so I mean it's it's really nice they have again they cater to the tourists so yeah um, fun fact the maximum a building can be in Bali is 15 meters so most buildings here can't get a permit beyond like four floors um, and you'll find yeah most buildings are like two floors three floors max some are four floors I was surprised when I met uh, when I went to Sanur and I was walking around and I saw a building that was like 10 floors and I was like oh my goodness I had to take pictures and ask the guard I actually got a really good guard the head of security there came to help and I asked him what is this and how is it that it's taller than any any building and he explained that it the building was built before the law was enforced so when you look online it says that there's a law that the buildings can't be higher than the coconut trees but then a friend of mine told me that the, there's this big statue which if you're on the beach in Changu you can see it in the distance and it's it's uh, dedicated to one of the gods and it's really it really just stands out so he told me that there is an agreement that no building in Bali should be taller than that statue I don't know which version is true you know but either way no building is above 15 meters by law <laughs> which makes it a place where it's built out laterally so if you're driving from Changu to Ubud while it's one hour away you'd imagine that there are sections where you're not seeing that much but it's built out or being farmed the entire journey along the road as you're driving so it's very um, like spread out everything is really spread out and everything especially in Changu is very compact so houses are built right next to each other and there's not much space between the houses and it's like concrete jungle in that the there's cabro everywhere very few sections with grass like if there are if you can look behind me like there there are some strips that have grass and a little you know a few areas like this hotel has a lot more grass than most places some places are just all cabros, tamak, cement, 
done in the entire place with just maybe a few strips of grass for color. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the effect that I've seen of that law in Bali. It's an interesting one and it's actually enforced. <laughs> ha, the nightlife. The nightlife is really vibrant. There are parties that go on, pool parties, Afrobeat parties. African music here is like really popular, like really, really popular. And I noticed this in Kuala Lumpur as well. African music is a hit. People sing African songs like they understand the words and they dance really well. I was surprised to come here and find Balinese people are dancing better than me. Like, I'm not gonna dance and compete with them. They're making me look like, like I should be the one who's like showing them the African moves. Mm -mm. These guys know how to dance. There are so many options. There are clubs I've been to that I'm like, what? It's in a basement. Where is the fire escape kind of thing? And there are dancers in cages. <laughs> like, it's it's interesting you you you'll find something that you like if you want to experience the nightlife i'm not that much of a nightlife person but whenever i travel or i'm in a new place i want to experience the nightlife because i want to see is it different from what i'm used to is it different compared to other countries how is it like so i'm really enjoying the nightlife and the fact that i have a cool community to go out with makes it even better like it's more interesting oh yeah the most common question i get asked is where are you from and i give up saying kenya <laughs> because no one really knows where kenya is so every time i would say kenya people are like huh so i have to say africa and they're like ah africa oh that's a beautiful country no it's a continent <laughs> but yeah a lot of people don't know um, any much about Africa and the only thing I've found commonly like whenever I say Africa people are like ah zamina mina eh eh waka waka eh eh I'm like Shakira from South America made Africa famous <laughs> uh, and then yeah what's the difference between Changu and and um, Ubud, like what, ha what have I found to be the difference? So it's very similar, like the way I find it, it's similar to like Nairobi is the equivalent of Changu, even if it's not the capital, but like busy kind of place with very cosmopolitan. And Ubud is like Nanyuki. So I'm finding Ubud very familiar. Uh, it's in the mountains, it's very, uh, very scenic green lots of uh, hills and lots of rice fields more than Changu and I've also found that there's a bit of a difference between the people in that Changu seems to be the place where all the supermodels are everybody seems to have a six-pack goes to the gym like male and female and a lot of them are influencers recording their videos everywhere taking pictures of their food and videos of their food for five minutes before they eat it. And in Ubud, it's very chill. Like it's more, I've seen like a hippie colony kind of place. I've seen very relaxed people, very uh, meditative, spiritual people. So that's what I found to be mostly in uh, Ubud. Uh, so, oh yeah, you can see. My, my sunbathers behind yeah so Ubud is very relaxed like people go home early they there is traffic just like Changu but you know it's it's different it's less people partying and doing crazy things and more people going to the market shopping um, there are some really cool shops I've seen on the way that have nice dresses and stuff like loose things that I can buy that I, I enjoy um, so yeah that's that's what I've seen is a difference um, and also Changu is very like for me the vibe between the two places I think I would live more in Changu than Obod um, because there's so much to do especially as a tourist like 
you come to Obod, it's cool. There are places to explore. You come and relax. Uh, I feel like you can spend a month, maybe two here. But if you, if I'm looking to stay in a place and have lots of activities and meet meet lots of people, then Changu is more of that kind of place. So, yeah, that would be that would be my verdict between the two places. But yeah, I think I've answered quite a number of questions. I can't think of anything else. Um, if you watched it, pray love like my cousin who made me watch the movie before I came here again uh, <laughs> and you're wondering about the love part I think that's going to come I'm going to share that in a subsequent video so stick around and stay tuned ah, I'm in Bali oh my god sometimes I want to pinch myself like I can't believe it because I'm like oh my goodness how did you do this Miss Jackie <sighs> okay Hiya. until next time bye